Thank you for joining our Building a College Going Culture webinar. At the Tennessee Higher Education Commission and the Tennessee Student Assistance Corporation, we are committed to relentlessly pursuing post-secondary credentials for all Tennesseans. Today, we're going to be asking the essential question, how do we as school counselors and educators, gear up site coordinators and advisors, enhance our school's college going culture? First and foremost, we as a faculty and a system need to have a, uh, shared beliefs. If I'm working within the context of a professional development or a training, these shared beliefs would be blank. These shared beliefs would be created and crafted in collaboration with a school faculty. When all of our school members and faculty have shared beliefs around college and career access, we are more effective and we have a direct impact on student aspirations and student achievement. What are the shared beliefs in your school? How can you move all of your educators to agreed upon shared beliefs? At THEC and TSAC, we have some shared beliefs that are shared here. First of all, college means any and all training. It is an imperative that we tell our parents, our families, our communities, our teachers, college is not only a four-year bachelor's degree, but is instead technical training, certification, and community college associate's degrees. We also want our students and our families to know college remains the best pathway to a great job. With a living wage, resilience from economic downturn, and even health insurance, a great job affords us a quality of life that we want for our children and our children's children. When students drive their own career and college pathways, they are more likely to persist. If we can get our schools and our educators to share this belief that students should be the ones driving their pathways, we will no longer disparage or discredit students' efforts or parents' involvement. We will instead empower students to craft their pathways because we, the adults in the room, have supported them along this process. Research also demonstrates that adults learn very differently than students. Effective professional development and adult training cannot treat adults the same as high school students. These five components are something to consider when developing your planning uh, for professional development. First of all, active learning is required if you want your adults and your faculty to learn because we have to treat these adults as professionals. They have experience, they have factual and content knowledge, as well as personal opinions that directly improve the quality of the instruction. And of course, number two, duration. The longer the professional development lasts, the more effective, the better it will be. So a 25 minute webinar is not going to have the same impact on student achievement as perhaps a, a monthly get together with our professional learning communities. Three and four are important because we have to focus on certain content. We cannot have a three hour professional development that addresses everything from school discipline, uniforms and college going rates. We have to make sure that we are focused and coherent because this is very different than, than children. Adults have finite time and overwhelming responsibilities, especially in a school setting. We have to respect them as professionals and number three and four have to be considered when developing an online or in-person professional development. And finally, how are you going to structure your professional development? Many of us are in webinars all the time in this virtual new landscape and new normal that we have, but are they effective? Is a webinar all that I need in order to get certain key data, deadlines, and information out to my team? Or is a professional learning community the way I think uh, adults on my faculty are going to learn? As we move into speaking 
uh, specifically about our students, we have to put them at the center. And we have to remember that the last six months has been very tumultuous for these students. So we have to focus on their mental health and their social and emotional uh, skills and resilience right now. So if a student does not sign up for a college visit or does not write an email response to you, perhaps the student is not intentionally dismissing your efforts but perhaps need some other in interventions that might require a school counselor or other mental health professional. A high school student has to trust that you, the educator and the adult counselor, believe that they are capable. Our actions, whether intentional or unintentional, directly impact how our students perceive us. Do we honestly and authentically model for our students that we believe that each and every one of them are college material? An activity that you could do with your students, um, and this resource will be available online on collegefortn.org as well as the THEC website. When our students say certain things to us, sometimes as teachers and adult school counselors, we neglect to listen for understanding. Instead, we listen to respond because we perceive every student's question or comment is a problem that we must solve. Instead, we have to hear what the students are trying to communicate, even though they might not have the words to do so. So when a student comes to us as a school teacher or counselor and says something to the effect of, my parents don't want me to move too far away from them, we need to hear from them that the students are very concerned about their parents' impact on their decision. Perhaps the students are not convinced that they should move away. Perhaps the students have a lot um, that they are responsible for in their current home situation. Maybe they help pay the bills, raise children, or even take care of an ailing parent, grandparent, or guardian. We cannot discredit or disparage the current life situations of our student in order to what we think is inspire them to transcend their their experience or to move out to a better place. We have to meet the students where they are. And another student who might say, I don't see students who look like me. Perhaps the students are communicating something along racial or economic lines. And students are also communicating that they're really deeply afraid of being alone and isolated in a very new challenge. Hearing the students where they are means that we are listening to understand. Asking clarifying questions is really important for us in building a college going culture. We want our teachers um, and our school counselors to all be on the same page here. We want them to develop a set, a set of norms. So when students say certain things, we as a school faculty are going to do these kinds of things in response. And also, it's a process. Students are currently building their own agency, and we have to incorporate their entire big picture understanding, their social, emotional, and their cognitive development. If we can develop our young people into advocates for themselves, then we will have been effective in developing the student's agency, which is defined here as initiative. Agency involves three things, motivation, engagement, and commitment. If we're going to directly connect these three components of building and developing a student's agency, here is an example. Our gear up site coordinators are responsible for taking our high school sophomores on a college visit. Whether it's a virtual or an in-person field trip to the local campus, we want to be focused on how we can engage our students and motivate them as well. So questions that we need to consider prior to getting on the bus or logging into that Zoom call with a college admissions representative is first, why are the students traveling or visiting this college? Were the students given, vo given voice or choice in that process? Or was it the most convenient we need to make certain that we are engaging the students so that they are not doing what we have told them to do, but they have some ownership in that process. 
The second thing to consider when planning for our high school sophomores to travel to a college is how will they demonstrate their engagement while they're there? Will they be asking questions that could be found in the student guidebook? Will they be asking questions that weeks before they have been planning and investigating on their own? Will they be asking um, for, will they be completing a scavenger hunt as students run from the dining hall to another location on campus? It is important that we think about how are the students engaged in this process and why we are traveling to these schools. And then finally, as adults, when we are committed to something, we are in, intrinsically motivated to learn on our own. How do the students take that visit and that experience and bring it back to their school, their peers, and their families? Are they building a student brochure for their faculty and their families to learn more about? Are they delivering a, an oral presentation or a PowerPoint to their classmates about why this school did or did not impress them during their college visits? How are we showing the students that commitment means we take this experience and we extend it and engage in it further? There are also four statuses of identity development. So the reason we share this information and this research from Dr. Mandy Savitz Romer at Harvard School of Graduate Education, Graduate School of Education, is because all of the students are in different places. A ninth grade student may be in a different place in forming his or her identity than perhaps an 11th or 12th grader. Or a middle school student might be in a very different place than a second or third grader. When we encounter students who are at different stages in their um, identity development, again, we must meet the students where, where they are. So the highlighted yellow here is where we'd really want our 10th graders to be. This is the ideal situation, but as we know, especially with COVID-19, for the last six months, it might be very difficult to unify our sense of self in this landscape. So we want our students to be actively exploring options, to be thinking about pathways for college and career, while also building and solidifying their own sense of self. If students are in the very first stage, identity diffused, these students have not yet had to or have not been willing to confront their own sense of self. The students in this stage might feel very overwhelmed about even talking about attending or applying to colleges. Making sure that we as school counselors and site coordinators engage them in this process requires that we use our professional experience to assess what has led the student to these decisions. Unfortunately, many of our students are in the foreclosure stage where they have already made a choice, where they have decided that they are going to this community college because that is the place that they are going and it's the only school they're going to apply to. This foreclosure can be good and bad, but if the student hasn't fully explored their options, this is a, a they foreclosed on the choice simply because of convenience. Instead, we want the students to move into that next place where they're actively exploring options. In the foreclosure stage, which many of our middle school and most of our high school freshmen are, we want to ask why over and over again, because then we can get to the root cause of why they have decided on going or not going to certain schools in the future. When our seniors have a achieve their sense of identity, this is when we can give them some opportunities to mentor other students. This can be very effective in a virtual landscape where seniors who have already decided that they're going to pursue pediatric nursing and they're going to start at a community college before transferring to a four-year institution, these students have mapped out their plan, they have a sense of who they are as individuals, and they can model for the other students in their class or younger students how they got to that place. Mandy Savitz Romer and Suzanne Buffard in their book, Ready, Willing and Able, which has been prominently cited and featured here in this presentation, admits that the students at the center of this college going identity process. So when we look at this as a school, as a faculty, we have to make sure that we're placing the student in the middle of this process. We do not want the college going process to be one of compliance, but we want it to be driven by the student. How do we get our students to move from step one 
all the way to step five. Well, first of all, I am college material, that belief for all students has to start very early on. Are we modeling this kind of positive self-talk for our students? Then are we moving the students to a place where they believe that they are capable of success? Do our academic tasks communicate to our students that they are capable of succeeding when faced with challenging academic, social, and um, emotional tasks? When teachers provide engaging lessons with high expectations and standards, this communicates to students that the teacher believes that they are capable of success. Along the road, the students must then experience success in order to truly believe this. If the students are stuck in one and two, there needs to be substantial interventions done by a team of caring adults and professionals. If students are still struggling in step one, we have to make sure that we move them. So by sophomore year, we've got them into steps three and then eventually four. Stuck in step one or step two, again, requires a lot of caring adults to assess and evaluate a plan for intervention. By the time they get, the student gets to number five, this is where they can fly on their own out of the nest but they recognize that their parents, their educators, their school counselors still have a great deal of information and resources to help them succeed at that next college level. So instead of dismissing their adults who have supported them throughout their high school or K through 12 education, these students recognize that adults in their lives who are caring and compassionate individuals are willing and ready to help them and support them. The next step when developing our professional development to inspire all of our school faculty to enhance our college going culture is to really provide them with a hands on active learning activity. When schools are provided with student level information and data outcomes, school professionals and educators need to have this information at their fingertips. So instead of providing teachers with data simply to disparage or discredit their efforts, it is important that we are intentional in the message and the tone that we communicate with our faculty. When we share student data, which includes college going information, matriculation, and even college success metrics, we need to make sure that we're intentionally communicating this and owning the success and the failures together as a team. As teachers, it is difficult to own the failures and we are embarrassed when we recognize that there are students who've fallen through the cracks, who've slipped through our fingers despite our best and hardest work. But one of the things when we have data in front of us is we can start to see some trends, some action steps, and ultimately an honest yet difficult conversation about what's working for our unique community and our students. So you could provide your faculty with four different students and these four worksheets or Word documents can be edited and modified, but these are real students who have attended high school, um, K through 12 in Tennessee and who have very different outcomes. So for example, student one is a male without any exceptional education or English language learner needs has been involved in the gear up program since their eighth grade and they graduated in 2018 with a regular diploma. They did necessary things like completing the Tennessee promise a free tuition program provided to every Tennessee res resident throughout Tennessee and they completed the free application for federal student aid on time as well. As you can see, the student's composite does not allow them, afford them eligibility into the Tennessee HOPE scholarship program. But the student's English and science scores do suggest the student is very capable of reading in a, at a high level. And as we very well know, college requires a great deal of reading comprehension skills. 
The students' math scores and reading scores are alarming and well below college readiness benchmarks as set by the ACT organization. However, we believe the student has academic potential as clearly demonstrated in their English and science scores. As we move through their Tennessee Ready scores, we can see in the ninth grade, the student started very strong. They were on grade level as proficient in both English 1 and Algebra 1. But unfortunately, as 10th and 11th grade happened, the student was no longer proficient in these key standard classrooms. The student increasingly missed more days. There was some improvement in their 10th grade, but overall missing um, 30 days or more is going to have an impact on any student's achievement. And as you can tell, the student's um, uniform grading policy there as, as set by Tennessee Board of Education or State Board of Education, they had a 2.0 by 12th grade. Did this student thrive at the next level? Did the student not enroll? Well, this student did not enroll in college or attend uh, college in the fall immediately following their high school graduation. So as the student had the potential to thrive and succeed at the next level, the student's academic readiness and perhaps social and emotional as well as identity crises did not afford the student the opportunity to enroll in college. Now, what questions do we have? Well, first of all, um, my contact information is here. My email, my direct phone um, are listed there. But what we want you to take away from this is that there are several important pieces in enhancing our school college going culture. There are very difficult conversations to be had around what works for our students when it comes to them leaving the nest and pursuing a college credential diploma or certificate or degree. So our task now and our call to action as we move forward is for us to critically evaluate our school's current attitudes and shared beliefs around college and career success. Is it enough in our schools and within our districts that our students enroll in college? Is it the metric that we want our students to be measured by? Graduation rates remain a very important indicator of our school's success. However, we need to have hard conversations about how those graduation rates and numbers directly correlate to college and career success. Please know that the Tennessee Higher Education Committee Commission is committed to serving you, our Gear Up site coordinators, as well as our advisors and all school counselors throughout Tennessee with free resources and, um, and development, lesson plan development as well. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you for your time.